Geneva, Switzerland birthed both one of the greatest and also one of the most destructive forces in Western society in the last half millennium. John Calvin's Geneva was an experiment in theocracy that brought abundant blessing, and those blessings caused Genevans a couple centuries later to grow fat and kick, and thus out came Rousseau. Samuel Johnson rightly said of him, quote, I think him one of the worst men, a rascal who ought to be hunted out of society as he has been, end quote. Yet despite the man himself being, quote, hunted out of society in his time, his ideas have unfortunately stuck around and reshaped society. Though central to Calvin's thought was the idea of the innate moral corruption of fallen man, Rousseau argued to the contrary that it is society which has made man fallen. As Voltaire put it, Rousseau would have us walking on all fours as savage man once walked, at least according to the evolutionist. In other words, we must go back to our primitive roots to discover our true selves, uncorrupted by civilization's impositions. That original state, Rousseau argued, was a state in which every man was socially equal and thus able to determine his own destiny, apart from the restrictions imposed by others in modern society. His societal vision, therefore, was to maintain our primitive state of equality, even while living in a developed society. Sovereignty, in this view, is only legitimate when it represents the, quote, general will, i.e. the interests of the people collectively. This idea of a, quote, social contract based on the, quote, general will would go on to fuel the French Revolution and all its lovely evils. Prior to Rousseau, Hobbes and Locke had both proposed variations on the idea of a social contract, which were likewise based on how they conceived of the state of nature. In each of these conceptions, there is only speculation as to what natural man looked like, and a general disregard for what God had already revealed concerning origins of humanity. Yet during Hobbes' own time, there was a man named Robert Filmer, whose ideas unfortunately went unheeded, in part for their reliance on the scriptural explanation of the origins of human society. It seems Western man was bent on innovative explanations that utilized confirmation bias to justify rebellion against legitimate authorities, rather than relying on the revealed history of our Lord. Yet now that we face the oppression of Rousseau's conception of savage liberty, which has essentially resulted in the hegemony of moral degenerates, it seems we might want to finally reconsider the vision of God for society, which Filmer expounded from the scriptures. In this essay, I want to present that vision as put forth by Filmer in the Old Testament. Then I want to lay out the biblical explanation of the purpose and meaning of this system, outline briefly the destructive authority void that has been left in its abandonment, and then present some speculative practical suggestions for how we can go about restoring it in the family, church, and society. Scripture and the Origins of Government if we're to take Genesis seriously, as we should, then we cannot continue to disregard what it has to say about the origins of human society. There are some who certainly do take it seriously as history, but thus far it has only given us a replica of Noah's Ark, and not a reconsideration of all the ways in which the structure of our present society presupposes an opposing view. If all men truly are created equal and only give up their rights to self-government through a social contract imposed on their natural state, then the biblical account is not true. But if the biblical account is true, then we must come up with a different rational explanation for government. In his book, Patriarcha, Sir Robert Filmer provides the exact biblical alternative that we require. While all of Christian civilization was suddenly crying liberty, Filmer began his work with the statement, quote, The desire of liberty was the first cause of the fall of Adam. Though liberalism really ought to have packed up its things and headed home at this point, Filmer continues by recounting the origins of human society from a biblical perspective. He begins with Adam and the covenantal authority established with him as father of all the living in the dominion mandate. Quote, Creation made man prince of his posterity, and indeed not only Adam, but the succeeding patriarchs had, by right of fatherhood, royal authority over their children. That the patriarchs were endowed with kingly power, their deeds do testify. For as Adam was lord of his children, so his children under him had a command and power over their children. But still with subordination to the first parent, who is the Lord paramount over his children's children to all generations, as being the grandfather of his people. I see not then how the children of Adam, or of any man else, can be free from subjection to their parents. And this subjection of children being the fountain of all regal authority, by the ordination of God himself, it follows that civil power, not only in general as by divine institution, but even the assignment of it specifically to the eldest parents, which quite takes away that new and common distinction, which refers only power universal and absolute to God, but power respective in regard to the special form of government to the choice of the people. 
end quote. In other words, his argument is that Adam's authority at the beginning of creation, as father of the world, was the origin of political authority. He possessed the right to rule as a gift of God in connection with his natural headship as father of humanity. Because of this, the rightful ruler of a people is he who is either the eldest parent or he who has inherited that God-given authority from the eldest parent. And since no one can throw off the natural obligation of honor for father and mother because of its foundation in an immutable biological indebtedness, so also are human governments ordained by God himself and not granted their sovereignty by the choice of men. To remove natural authority in favor of a choice of a majority is not only to choose an impractical political arrangement, though that is certainly the case, but it is also to rebel against both nature and the God who established nature. Fulmer then continues by outlining the connection of civil authority to patriarchal authority in the narrative of Genesis. Quote, This lordship which Adam, by command, had over the whole world, and by right descending from him the patriarchs did enjoy, was as large and ample as the absolutist dominion of any monarch, which hath been since the creation. For dominion of life and death, we find that Judah the father pronounced sentence of death against Tamar, his daughter-in-law, for playing the harlot. Bring her forth, saith he, that she may be burnt. Touching war, we see that Abraham commanded an army of 318 soldiers of his own family. And Esau met his brother Jacob with 400 men at arms. For matter of peace, Abraham made a league with Abimelech, and ratified the articles with an oath. These acts of judging and capital crimes, of making war, and concluding peace, are the chiefest marks of sovereignty that are found in any monarch. Not only until the flood, but after it, this patriarchal power did continue, as the very name patriarch doth in part prove. The three sons of Noah had the whole world divided amongst them by their father, for of them was the whole world overspread. According to the benediction given to him and his sons, be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth." End quote. He points out here that the royal dominion vested in Adam as father is carried out in subsequent patriarchs throughout Genesis. Judah pronounces a death sentence, Abraham wages war and cuts political alliances, Esau commands an army, and Noah divided the dominion of the whole world to his sons as an inheritance. We could further note that the Noahic covenant, which many theologians identify as the official founding of civil authority, was clearly a renewal and extension of Adam's dominion mandate. Thus, Noah is given the civil sword as the new Adam, the new father of humanity. After this, Filmer recounts how the nations were then divided according to the various families descending from Noah, and rule continued to be by fathers. Israel was ruled by a single patriarch until they went into Egypt, where they were sojourners under the rule of Pharaoh. Though I would point out that when they entered into the land, Joseph had become, as Genesis says, quote, a father to Pharaoh, Genesis 45, 8. Further, both Israel and Egypt are said at that time to be ruled on a lower level by, quote, elders, who were lesser patriarchs under the rule of Pharaoh. Genesis 57. When God delivers Israel from Egypt, he briefly reestablishes autocratic rule in Moses, which is then carried on by Joshua. Though their provisional government was not due to a paternal relationship to the people, it should be noted that they did arrange the authority structure under them according to those they already knew to be elders or, quote, heads of households over the people. Numbers 1116. After the death of Joshua, judges arose whose effectiveness seemed limited only to retroactively delivering Israel from its repeated descent into chaos, which the book of Judges directly attributes to the nation's lack of a monarch. Quote, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Judges 17.6, 21.25. When David is established as king, Israel finally receives a ruler with enough power to establish the unparalleled order and peace that was experienced in the time of Solomon. The monarchy represents God finally returning the blessing of patriarchal rule and succession to Israel. In other words, because of their corporate conformity to the natural pattern of authority, which is the rule of one father over all, they were blessed abundantly. Also notice that the full extent of the unity and prosperity brought about by the righteous rule of David is not experienced until the following generation. This is central to the particular way in which monarchy is designed to bless a nation. To a thousand generations. When the Lord passes his glory before the eyes of Moses, he proclaims, Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love to a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children 
to the third and fourth generation. Exodus 34, 6 through 7. What the Lord is proclaiming here is essentially an extended version of what the Apostle John states over a millennium later, quote, God is love, 1 John 4, 8. Yet his love is not experienced by individuals in a manner that is abstracted from history. Rather, his love deals particularly with generations. And his wrath likewise deals out judgments towards fathers, quote, on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. God's dealings with humanity do not involve isolated individuals, but individuals who are one flesh with other humans. Even Christ himself was capable of inheriting the promises of Abraham and David, only because he had them for his fathers. Romans 1-2, Galatians 3-16. This by no means grants us the right to dish out civil punishments on children for the crimes of their fathers, as the Lord makes clear in Ezekiel 18-20. But it is clear that the blessings and curses that God sends upon his people are felt most strongly by those who descend from those who evoke them. Men's deeds are seeds, and their attendant blessings or curses are the fruit that is reaped by the generations after him. You reap what you sow, but your children and children's children reap a hundredfold. This means that you are upstream of your children, and thus if you piss in the stream, your children will end up with golden salty water to drink. God's concern for intergenerational relationships is why, among the two tables of the Ten Commandments, the first of which concerns love for God, and the second of which concerns love for neighbor, quote, honor thy father and mother is included in the first. And as Paul notes, quote, it is the first commandment with a promise, Ephesians 6, 2 through 3. Specifically, the promise for those who honor their parents is the blessing of a long life in the land that God has given them. In other words, to maintain the blessing of God in society, men must highly honor their parental authorities. And the corollary, of course, is that those who dishonor their parents will be vomited out of the land. The Lord promises in Malachi 4.6 that when John the Baptist comes, he will, quote, turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Jesus points out in Mark 7, 9 through 13, that the traditions of the Pharisees were actually used to nullify the commandment of God to honor father and mother. And thus, as we know from history, they were indeed vomited out of the land before that generation passed away. They had not heeded the words of Malachi or John the Baptist to be reconciled to their fathers, so they did not live long in the land. But why exactly is the father-son relationship the metric by which God judges whether, whether or not to evict a people from the face of the earth? Well, it ultimately relates to how he would fulfill the dominion mandate and restore the earth. Adam, the first human son of God and father of all humanity, failed his task of dominion. He failed to be a righteous ruler, but instead rebelled against God's own righteous rule. This subjected the whole earth to a curse and caused Adam to be expelled from the Garden of Eden. But God promised that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent, whose temptation brought about the curse, and would thereby allow man back into the paradise of God's presence. Thus, at the fullness of time, God the Father gave his Son to the world, so that the world might be brought back by the Son to the Father. In his death, Christ triumphed over the serpent that held the world captive and received from the Father all authority in heaven and on earth. It is thus the love of the Father for the Son and the love of the Son for the Father that redeems the world. It is in the image of this redeeming love that the system of hereditary succession is created. What I mean is that the world is designed in such a way that the gift of a son redirects a father's interests toward the improvement of his domain as a continual foreshadowing and now reenactment of the gospel. George Gilder notes that, despite what modern egalitarians would have us believe, there are biological differences between men and women that ensure that men will inevitably dominate. He writes of the abundance of sci recent scientific research on male behavior among both humans and animals, which found that, quote, the man is rendered more aggressive, exploratory, volatile, competitive, and dominant, more visual, abstract, and impulsive, more muscular, appetitive, and tall, he is less nurturant, moral, domestic, stable, and peaceful, less auditory, verbal, and sympathetic, less durable, healthy, and dependable, less balanced, and less close to the ground. He is more compulsive sexually and less secure. Within his own sex, he is more inclined to affiliate upwards toward authority, and less inclined to affiliate downward towards children and toward the weak and needy. Because of these biological facts, which societal standards are unable to change, no matter how much they try, Man will always dominate in society. The question is thus not whether man will dominate, but rather which mode of domination man will employ. But women, Gilder argues, take the dominant, volatile, and sexually compulsive nature of man and turn it toward productivity in the future. 
How does she do this? She does this by bearing him children. Unmarried men have what is called a high time preference. Time preference, if you are unaware, refers to decision making that is led by a desire for what is most time efficient, rather than what will lead to the greater outcome in the long run. For instance, when you have to leave for work in five minutes but need something to eat, you will be more likely to grab a granola bar from the pantry than cook yourself a steak. This is not because you like granola bars better than steak, but because you have a high time preference. This is what it is like to be an unmarried man choosing how to carry out his desires. His natural inclination is to exercise his aggression, ex exploration, volatility, competitiveness, and domination in a manner that demonstrates a preference for short-term gains, rather than what will be best in the long term. But if this man comes to love one woman, and that woman provides him with a child whom he loves, suddenly his mind is lifted beyond his immediate situation. His heart is attached to the future, and he is going to channel his masculine instincts toward building things that will last, to be enjoyed by his children and his children's children. Such is the way in which God's natural covenant structure of marriage reorients male sexuality from domination to dominion. By this means, the son of any man becomes a gift to the world around him. This is the case for monarch and peasant alike. When a man has a child, he is no longer concerned only for his immediate needs and what will happen during his own lifetime. He wants to give his children a better life than he himself has been able to live, and as a result becomes the sort of person who plants trees whose fruit he will not live to enjoy. This man, even if he only has dominion over three acres and a cow, is an asset to society. But when he has dominion over a whole people, the fact of his fatherhood is even more impactful. Hans Hermann Hoppe has written of the contrast in time preference between a private gov government owner, i.e. a monarch whose kingdom is essentially a large-scale household, and a public government manager, i.e. temporary elected official. He points out that a private government owner, whose domain is his own personal possession, which his own flesh and blood will inherit, will have a lower time preference than the public manager, whose economic interest is disconnected from that of his domain. This seems rather obvious when you think about it. If a public official is only in office for four to eight years, then it is in his best interest to make decisions that will maximize his profits in the short term, even if it is to the detriment of the long-term interests of his domain. He is only a hired hand and not a shepherd, so he is only in it for the paycheck. But consider on the other hand a man whose economic and familial interests are bound up in those of his domain. In this case, he has no option to cash out while his domain crashes and burns. He is a shepherd, not a hired hand. And while a father is certainly capable of disregarding the interests of his children and wastefully spending their inheritance, this is an exception to the norm rather than a feature of the system as in the case of hired hands. The son of a king is thus a gift to his people, after the pattern of God's gift of his own son in the gospel. Just as God the Father gave his son for the eternal life of the world, so also the son of a patriarch is a gift ensuring that he will work for the preservation of the domain that his son will inherit. To have an heir is to turn one's domain into an inheritance, and thus the greater a monarch's love is for his son, the greater his love will be for his people. Further, the greater the son's love is for his father, the more he will be incentivized to preserve that which his father passed down to him. This is a system that is simply not built into the modern system of hired hands. It ought then to be no surprise that Western society has been unable to move in any direction but toward leftward entropy. We are all artificial men with no roots because our system itself is one of constant change, passing from hired hand to hired hand, being exploited and then handed off with no concern for our future. Because we are a fatherless nation, we will not live long in the land. In the words of our overlords, quote, you will own nothing and you will be happy. The Tyranny of the Empty Chair Returning to Gilder's point that men will inevitably dominate, it should be emphasized that this proposal for the return to patriarchy is not an argument for elitism as opposed to the equality and liberty of all people. The latter option certainly sounds nice in theory, but is impossible in practice. All you end up with in a liberal order are men who exploit ideas of equality and freedom to consolidate power in their own hands by eliminating their competition. You can try all you want to have a social order where, for example, women are artificially exalted to positions of power like men, but the re reality will always be certain elite men who have dominated everyone else and end up choosing which women to exalt. Elite men are inevitable. It is thus not whether you will have elite men, but which elite men you will have. Concerning the family, Douglas Wilson has remarked that all households are ultimately patriarchal, and it is simply the case that certain households are, quote, dominated by the empty seat at the table. 
When you leave a power vacuum where God has woven a position of power into the natural order, it does not simply remain a vacuum. What ends up happening is that people who are not granted that power by nature, and are thus far less equipped for the job, end up assuming the position. And that which the unqualified non-fathers both do and fail to do, work together to sow disorder into their domain. I noted above that when Israel had no king, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. To a libertarian, such a statement might sound like a utopian degree of liberty. But according to the biblical author, this was chaos and anything but liberty. Without a king, the Lord had to continually raise up judges to save Israel from their own decisions. And when a righteous judge, such as Gideon, died off, the people immediately whored after the Baals, and Abimelech and his mother's relatives schemed to get him installed as king by the leaders of Shechem. In other words, specifically those of Jotham. In the absence of a healthy olive or fig tree, as rightful king, the trees chose worthless bramble to rule over them. The vacuum would be filled one way or another. This is the case for a family and a nation alike. When you try to establish the matriarchal family, for instance, by having a nanny state give free money to single mothers, thus incentivizing the fatherless household, the father's empty chair still dominates. The fathers do not disappear into thin air, but remain at large and undomesticated. They continue to express their male biological urges, with high time preference, by participating in gang violence, drug abuse, unrestrained seed sowing, and living well beyond their means. The boys of the matriarchal household have no positive example of masculinity at home, and thus are drawn into the toxic kind outside, while the women are recruited to vote Democrat, because that means more money not to marry. By means of offering high time preference incentives, our societal elites essentially create their ideal citizens. These citizens have no competing or intermediary elites, but are under their direct care. In order to get them to rally behind their causes, all they need to do is dangle cheese from a fishing line and they will follow their lead. On top of this, these citizens, who are disproportionately minorities, can be used as props for manipulating more wealthy classes into promoting their political and cultural changes using pity and guilt. Want to promote the gay agenda? Put a brown stripe on the flag. Want to abolish the right to voluntary association? Call it civil rights. Want to oppose traditional Christian values? Refer to them as a dangerous new ideology called, quote, white Christian nationalism. Want more state control over the economy? Just call free markets racist. By calling literally everything racist, our present elites maintain their monopoly of power by reinforcing high time preference and the breakdown of the natural family. They hold either cheese or pity in front of our faces and guide us wherever they will. Because the paternal void has been left open in all our institutions, these hostile elites have stepped in to both maintain and fill that void. As demonstrated in the repeated salvation brought by judges, and the eventual longer lasting peace brought by King David, the only thing that can deliver us from hostile elites are good elites. In particular, the solution is a single paternal elite heading up all God-given institutions. Only if we return power to men that have their competitive and dominating instincts domesticated by paternal affection will we ever be delivered from the hegemony of crony capitalists, lying journalists, ideologically driven professors, hired hand politicians, Hollywood celebrities, and any other category of person you'd find on Epstein's flight logs. Families, churches, and nations have had their back doors open to degeneracy pushers, and it will take patriarchs with complete veto power to clean them out. It will take a clear and decisive vision, unhindered by the inefficiencies of easily infiltrated, divided, and slow-moving bureaucracies, to successfully push back against the zeitgeist-fueled entropy that has a greater sway with the decision-making of a group. We will have great difficulty in finding this necessary clarity and decisiveness in any group of managers. It will only be found in a strong patriarch, whose paternal affection and care for the long-term prosperity embolden him to stand against the short-sighted influence of the mob and its infiltrators. Restoring Patriarchy This restoration of patriarchy will not be successful unless it happens in every sphere, the family, the city of God, and the cities of man. It is thus necessary that we examine what a thoroughly patriarchal reformation would look like in each of these spheres. In the family. At the most cellular level, the building block of the other spheres of society, the family must be reformed along patriarchal lines. If we are to understand the magistrate as the father writ large, then we should also understand the father as magistrate over his own little domain. This means that a mere complementarianism will not do, especially in the form it is taken among the secret egalitarians who have co-opted the term. 
We must be very clear that men and women do not merely have equal but complementary roles, but rather that man is the head of the woman in the same way that Christ is the head of the church. He is her Lord, and she is his subject. Especially amidst the confusion that is intentionally sown by infiltrating egalitarian women like Amy Byrd, we must be very clear that man's authority is a magisterial authority. Consequently, both the wife and her children ought to respect the head of her household, as they respect a magistrate, and the man must make it clear that he expects that respect from them. This does not mean he must be cold. Our Father for heaven, after all, is far from cold. But we are nonetheless to fear him. In the same way, earthly fathers ought to be warm and gracious, yet at the same time firm and fearful. They must have the full dynamic range of a temperate wrath and an overflow of generosity. It must be known to the children that their father has clear, concrete expectations, and that there will be either rewards or consequences for their fulfillment or failure to fulfill those expectations. Yet whether he disciplines or praises, each must clearly flow from a love and affection that is evident and constant. There must be laws of the household that are clearly known and consistently enforced, so that the children know that the throne, or more likely the recliner in the living room, of their father is righteousness and not spontaneous outbursts based on an arbitrary target in constant motion. In order to establish this respect, the use of symbols of authority can be of great practical benefit. C.R. Wiley in his fantastic book, Man of the House, demonstrates the importance of a father having gravitas and inspiring pietas in his household. One practical symbol that can be set in place towards these ends is the setting aside of space that is exclusively father space. He writes, quote, you really must set aside some spaces in the house for yourself. Make it prominent and central. If it comes with a door, great, use it. When I bought the house we currently live in, it had nothing like this. I put in an office. I gave it a vaulted ceiling, the only one in the house. A built-in desk with storage and windows all around to take in the property. Then I crowned it by putting in a large leather chair. Everyone knows this is my office and that this is my chair. I have other chairs in the house, the one at the head of the table, for example, and another leather chair by the hearth. Here's something that just occurred to me as I'm writing this. I've never walked in on one of my children, or even my wife, sitting in one of my chairs, and I don't recall ever telling them they shouldn't, they just don't." End quote. Just as the Lord taught piety to his people while they were children, using the symbolism of sacred space that was set apart from that which is common, so also fathers may use symbolic father spaces for the same purpose. These special spaces or objects act as a constant reinforcement of the obedience and respect that is due to the one to whom they are set aside. When the child passes by the glorious recliner of patriarchal power, the little son of Adam is tempted by the mere command not to sit. Like the fruit on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it is something that is clearly a good thing, but which is bad for him simply because it has been prohibited. In other words, the chair looks good for sitting, and it will make the lad like his dad. Why should he not have just one good sit while no one is looking? It represents the foundation of morality, which is obedience to rightful authority rather than doing what is right in one's own eyes. While a command against stealing or hitting might be found more reasonable in the child's eyes, it is a lot harder to find a prohibition against sitting in a perfectly good chair to be agreeable. Yet the fact that sitting is generally a very small matter, as is the eating of fruit from a tree, is precisely the point. It highlights the fact that obedience is being rendered for the sole purpose of respecting the giver of the command, and that sin stems from the desire to disobey him. Being trained in this way, a child is prepared for situations in which even evil things at times become pleasing to the eyes. In addition to establishing the gravitas of patriarchs as lord of the household, fathers must also take primary hands-on responsibility for their children's education. The central responsibility of a father, according to scripture, is to raise a child, quote, in the discipline and admonition of the Lord, Ephesians 6, 4, so that, quote, when he is old, he will not depart from it, Proverbs 22, 6. When giving the laws, Moses told fathers, quote, you shall teach them diligently to your children, and speak of them when you sit at home and when you walk along the way, when you lie down and when you rise up, Deuteronomy 6, 7. There are two main principles about education we should take from these passages. First, education is a responsibility primarily of parents, and especially of fathers. Though parents must often recruit the help of schools, and even homeschooling fathers must often delegate formal teaching to the mother, a father must still make sure he is the primary overseer and guide of the education. There should be no greater influence on the formation of knowledge in children than their father. Secondly, these passages show that education is discipleship, and therefore, first and fo foremost, it is about shaping of character. 
This means that public education should be out of the question. The goal of secular public education is simply to prepare kids for a career. It is to prepare them for what Joseph Paper calls the world of total work, which has no place for the leisure of the free religious and thoughtful life. In other words, secular education prepares children for a Sabbath-free life of slavery to corporate higher-ups. This may be a feminist dream, but it ought to be a Christian nightmare. A father must understand his child's education primarily as discipleship, and consequently must seek above all to guide them in all areas of life toward maximized glorification of Christ. Another step toward the restoration of patriarchy in the family is the restoration of the household as the center of productivity and economic life. An enormous contribution to the transformation of Western man into a rootless, nomadic, radical individualist is the transfer of economic activity from the home to the factory, or the office, or wherever else it has gone after the Industrial Revolution. It used to be that a person got nearly all of his goods from others in his community and his family, whether they would be the millers or smiths or shoemakers, together formed one crucial unit of this interdependent small-scale small economy. This meant that one's identity was formed largely by the community role of one's father. But when the Walmarts moved into town and the neighbors found they could get products cheaper and quicker on Amazon, it crushed all sorts of family businesses in the economic unity and succession that existed within them. As a result, when the kids grow up, they no longer have a business to inherit from their father, and neither will the Walmart or Amazon warehouse provide them a lasting career that will allow them to stay local. Instead, each child must be sent across the country to a leftist university in order to find a new identity for themselves, thereby turning them into nomads cut off from their former home and their values. The home in this nomadic society has simply become a place where one eats, sleeps, and pisses between the productive hours at the office. To revive the centrality of patriarchal authority in the family, the home must become something more than a place to watch Netflix together. Men need to find some way to turn their home into a center of productivity. It is not likely that many of us will be able to quit our jobs and be sustained by a home business, at least not for a while. But we can take steps to supplement our external productivity and income with some sort of home productivity, no matter how modest it might be. What is most important is to take whatever steps are possible to rival the external realm of authority that maintains its exclusivity in part through its monopoly on economic activity. This might require that men move their families closer to other like-minded people who are attempting a similar restoration of the home-centered economy. You need the stability of locals who are committed to supporting your business, even despite the crony capitalism that makes corporate monopolies a more convenient option. And this is even further complicated by the standards set by such monopolies, which is offering a pinch of incense to the rainbow flag in order to ward off the woke mobs. So you also need the devotion of those who likewise have skin in the game, and the same values to support you when the blue-haired women begin writing their one-star Yelp reviews. In addition to providing the whole family with a common role in the community, a patriarch should also provide them with an identity associated with certain values. In other words, your last name should mean something. It should not merely be how the homeschool co-op distinguishes between all the kids named Josiah, Malachi, and Ezra. There instead should be a certain values and attitudes that come to mind when your last name is uttered. It ought to be clear to everyone in your household that there is a certain way of life and standard of excellence that is associated with belonging to your family. Toward this end, it may even be beneficial to establish some sort of visual symbol similar to a family crest and motto. All in your house should be made to feel that behavior that strays from this meaning is a violation of their very identity. Family, ultimately, is not about blood, but also equally, if not more so, about covenant. Marriage is a covenant, Malachi 2.14, by which two become one flesh, Genesis 2.24, which is established so that man might have assistance in his mandate to be fruitful, multiply, and fill and subjugate the earth, Genesis 1.28. Both Meredith Klein in his book Treaty of the Great King and Ray Sutton in his book That You May Prosper have noted that biblical covenants have a five-fold covenant structure consisting of transcendence, hierarchy, ethics, oath, and succession. As a covenant reality, the family involves the transcendence of God, the authority of the father as vicegerent of God, the ethical instruction of parents from the law of God, the covenant signs, like circumcision in the Old Covenant and baptism in the New, that formally recognize the status of children as holy, 1 Corinthians 7.14, and the obligations of inheritance on the father, and the keeping of traditions on the sons. 
Therefore, to be a part of a family is not merely a material reality, but additionally comes with religious, ethical, and practical obligations, which bring dishonor and a curse upon the one who neglects them. This understanding of the family must be restored if there is to be any sort of patriarchal renewal throughout society. This is the case first because it is the only thing that can provide the transcendent foundation for the sense of filial duty that is required for the faithful transfer of institutions, values, and practices from one generation to the next. Curtis Yarvin is right when he recognizes that a new elite needs to become worthy of replacing our present elites. But he is wrong to recognize his degenerate Burning Man attending elite crowd as potential candidates. Instead, traditional elites exalted to their positions of influence by descent, and bound by covenant to honor and continue the legacy of their forefathers, are all that will be worth setting up in place of the powers that be. Second, as the family multiplies and organizes itself intentionally as a political community, the covenantal family establishes a foundation for outsiders to be included without posing threats generally associated with immigration, and for insiders to be excluded for betrayal. This is an important corrective for those who want to tie nationalism to the merely physical reality of ethnic descent. The quote, white replacement, that many on the right are worried about, cannot be combated when skin color and general European descent, along with a vague concept of Western values, is all that constitutes our nationality. Biblical nationality is in incompatible with a tribeless, clanless, 1.5 child household nation like the present United States and this cannot be recovered by a retroactive, anachronistic redefinition of our filial obligations on such broad lines. We instead must rebuild from scratch covenantal communities, centered on but not exclusively defined by physical descent from a specific patriarch, that understand themselves as being bound by a divine covenant in nature to remain as one united institution for generations to come. Today's patriarchs find themselves, in other words, as new Abrahams, sojourning as a nomad in the land of strangers, but carrying in his loins a whole nation that will inherit the land. And mind you, he had a head start of 318 men not from his loins, who were nonetheless bound him as their father by covenant. In the City of God In addition to the family, the church must likewise be repatriarchalized. The first and most crucial element of restoring patriarchy in the church is to have strong shepherdly pastors who do more than give lip service to church discipline. This does not mean, of course, harsh pastors who beat up on their congregation or who abuse their authority by manipulating their congregants, but it does involve pastors beating up on wolves when they show their teeth and making rightful use of their authority to bring back sheep from their wandering. Even among Reformed churches that emphasize the importance of church discipline in their teaching, it is rare that you see it being practiced well. From what I have witnessed, church discipline is often used simply as a way of quieting down people in the congregation who have said or done things that have upset the Karens in the congregation. It is usually far more passive-aggressive than direct and authoritative, and usually is afraid of upsetting women in particular, sometimes to the point of excluding them from church discipline altogether. Because people in our society view any authority whatsoever as heavy-handed, church authorities have a tendency to overcorrect and not put their foot down nearly enough. The only time they are harsh is when someone has committed the sin of not being, quote, nice, again usually to the dismay of Karens. Douglas Wilson has referred to all of this as, quote, the cult of niceness. Our ministers, much like our parents, need to let go of their desire to be considered as a peer by those under their authority. They need to let go of the desire to be liked. Many congregants will be offended and accusations of authoritarianism will arise if ministers act like the spiritual magistrates they are. But by giving in to those easily offended, egalitarian-minded congregants, pastors and elders are essentially setting up their church's faction of Karens as de facto rulers of the congregation. This de facto Karen rule is an epidemic in our churches, and it is why modern evangelical sermons, songs, liturgies, and overall culture are also gay. It is all overwhelmingly, nauseatingly effeminate, and it is because our churches are ruled by a matriarchal shadow government of soccer moms and grandmothers whose bitching has intimidated their spineless hired hands. Ministers must instead be men, and by this I mean real men, and they must appeal primarily to other men, and again by this I mean the real kind. We need to revive masculine preaching that convicts of sin and leads to maturity, and often needs to be explained later to the women at home, 1 Corinthians 14.35. And we need men with the backbone to confront sinful men, 
even handing them over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh, if they cease to repent of their abominable deeds. 1 Corinthians 5 5. We need men who would sooner silence the Karens than silence the old prophets who mock the Baal worshippers. We need ministers who are preparing the patriarchs of their congregation for war by singing psalms about Christ crushing his enemies, not she males with man buns singing about Jesus tenderly embracing them like a passionate lover. We also are in desperate need for ministers whose preaching is not, quote, gospel centered. Obviously, I do not mean that preaching shouldn't actually be legitimately gospel centered. But what, quote, gospel centered preaching has come to mean is essentially, quote, soul salvation through faith alone, abstracted from all tangible applicability whatsoever. In an effort to, quote, keep the main thing the main thing, these gospel centered preachers have neglected their duty to help their sheep apply the Word of God to every area of life. As a result, their congregants are completely blind as they try to navigate the world, while its descent into complete madness continues to accelerate. They have no idea how to live because every passage is mangled in order to fit it into the same three-point message of how to get saved. Pastors need to recognize that they are negligent fathers if they fail to prepare their little children to engage the world. Christians do not need to simply be reminded over and over of the ABCs of the faith. To preach only how to get saved every Sunday, and even to discourage preaching about anything else, is like a mother who forces her adult children to keep breastfeeding and looks down upon all food that requires teeth. They are abusing their flock by keeping them in diapers and leaving them undefended as they go out into the world where they are constantly assailed by wolves. We need pastors who acknowledge their roles as shepherds and fathers, and thus teach their flock how to interpret and engage with all of life. If the Bible's teaching on economics, business, law, sex, child-rearing, education, and so forth is not expounded from the pulpit, then a counterfeit in each of these areas will be expounded from TikTok, Netflix, CNN, or the godforsaken Vice. It is simply appalling that there are so many pastors content with themselves as their congregants grope blindly in all these areas, adopting the ways of the world and destroying themselves as a result. Further, we need pastors who will oversee the growth of genuine community in their congregation. Too many churches are just a collection of a couple hundred strangers whose fellowship consists merely of the Sunday service and the brief conversations they have as they make their way out of the sanctuary. And even in churches that have it a bit more together than this, getting together regularly for meals and discipleship groups, still do not do much programmatic, legitimate community building. The minimal activity of churches can to a large degree be explained by the acceptance of overspecialization of our society, which is justified by the aforementioned gospel-centered preaching. It used to be the case that churches were communities in the fullest sense of the word, and handled a large variety of things that are now delegated to a multitude of external institutions and specialists. Theological scholarship, philosophical discovery, and ministerial training were all formally handed by the church but have now been transferred to external educational institutions. Hospitality, medicine, counseling, charity, elder care, and adoption were likewise all handled by the church, and now also have their own highly state-regulated and mostly secularized institutions. Artists and musicians likewise once received the patronage of the church to make perceptible the invisible kingdom of God, but are now just about unanimously at the head of cultural embrace of degeneracy. Churches were once the center of life and welfare of a society, and now are just one of the numerous compartmentalized vendors of optional specialized services. It may be objected that the church only handled those things at a former time because they were merely fulfilling a need which these new institutions now fulfill instead, and therefore there is no longer any need for the church to address such things. But this objection would ignore the cost of the loss of direct church oversight. Hospitals, for instance, once saved lives, now they butcher babies, help people commit suicide, and help enforce the tyranny of, quote, medical experts. Charity, likewise, was once an imitation by believers of divine grace that was withheld from the lazy. Now it is rebranded as, quote, welfare, taken forcibly from the pockets of others, and given out haphazardly even to the lazy or, quote, discouraged workers, as they call them. Counseling was once called confession, and involved the owning up to one's own sins. Now it's a service that is too expensive for some, mostly involves the confession of one's own parents' sins rather than one's own, and often treats sins as a medical disorder of which one is a victim, rather than evil behavior for which one is responsible and of whom God is the victim. Elderly care also once involved a highly honored religious order of widows, as outlined in Paul's letter to Timothy, 
who were considered altars in the tabernacle service of the church, offering up prayers continually and instructing younger women in exchange for the support of the church. Now elderly widows are left in nursing homes with negligent nurses, where they often feel imprisoned, purposeless, and abandoned. It is simply the case that parachurch organizations and secular institutions cannot perform nearly as well as the church in all these areas, and society suffers greatly as a result of our acceptance of their delegation. And the church suffers too, as congregants who are not called to pastoral ministry are left with few opportunities to serve other than tithing and setting up the coffee in the foyer. The church needs to cease to be one of the many services in a secular community, and become once again a comprehensive community in itself, organized hierarchically under its spiritual fathers. Pastors, therefore, need to take charge in returning these things to their oversight. This obviously will not happen overnight, considering the megachurch-level assets required to set all these things up in full force, but they can begin setting aside funds and delegating responsibilities to these tasks on a much smaller scale, with a long-term vision of developing them into larger ministries. The most immediate priority is to bring theological, biblical, and philosophical scholarship back into the institution of the church, along with ministry education. From the starting point of an inner church academic program for pastors, it can potentially branch out into training in whatever skills are necessary for other areas of ministry as well. It is essential that legitimately qualified ministers take control of these institutions so that the drift toward degeneracy is avoided. Unless professors, physicians, and overseers of welfare are held to standards of teachers and deacons in the church by the church's own ordained patriarchs, their positions will inevitably drift toward moral and social entropy. In the Cities of Man Given that the United States is a, quote, democratic republic, and is attempting to shape the world in its image, it might seem an impossible task to have patriarchal authority in modern governments. But as Caesar once utilized Rome's then-existing political structure to establish a new monarchical regime, the same sort of thing can be done in the United States. In fact, as Curtis Yarvin has pointed out, the same sort of thing has been done in the United States, multiple times in fact. Washington in 1789, Lincoln in 1861, and FDR in 1933. Yarvin presents FDR specifically as the model of a Caesarian figure who demonstrates a degree of respect for what came before him, all the while establishing a regime in which the executive branch acquired preeminence, a power which he compares to that of Congress in the present day. On a smaller scale, Ron DeSantis is doing something similar in Florida, while not quite on a Caesarian level, he has certainly set out to combat the degeneracy pushed by the left, signing 32 bills and five vetoes in one day this past June. Included among his slew of changes is a bill which would give a board full of his own appointees power over hiring decisions in Florida universities, and which would also bar general education, quote, curriculum that teaches identity politics such as critical race theory, or defines American history as contrary to the creation of a new nation based on universal principles stated in the Declaration of Independence. He has also taken over Disney's special taxing district and revoked public funding from the Tampa Bay Rays, both of whom have promoted leftist political causes and the gay alphabet agenda. A president, governor, county executive, or mayor can thus most certainly pull off a Caesarian strategy of de facto monarchism. And this is not only desirable, but also necessary to combat the influence of the elites of degeneracy. It takes one shepherd, unhindered by the divided loyalties and inefficiencies of a bureaucracy, to clean house of degenerate hired hands. Obviously, this is not a final solution to the problems of our present system, since it does not establish the benefits of lifelong reign and hereditary succession, which are necessary for the maintenance of a monarch's house cleanings. But it is at least a feasible solution for the short term until we can somehow change the political system itself. It would essentially be our system of judges before we can finally get a real monarch in power. Now, our strategy of change is going to need to involve work on all levels. First, for the average Christian, work in the city and county is going to be the easiest and most effective route. An individual's vote and voice is simply pretty inconsequential at a federal and state level. But on the smaller scale of county and below, the average person has a higher chance of making some kind of change. It is therefore necessary for change that these lower levels of government be targeted by more populist, quote, bottom-up sorts of efforts. It is also necessary that we divide the level of city and county efforts into two categories, retreat of work in less populated rural areas and offensive work in more populated urban areas. This could also be referred to in the terms of Adam's dual task as our garden keeping and our world conquest. Just as Adam had both a prototypical paradise to protect and cultivate, 
as well as a wild world to tame and transform. So also we must organize ourselves to settle in both areas of retreat and areas of battle. The area of retreat is where we build our defenses, and the area of battle is where we push back against the enemy. Both are necessary in our spiritual warfare. In his book, The Confessional County, Raymond Simmons proposes a strategy for planting our garden retreats. In light of our underperformance in the culture wars, and the increasing difficulty of building anything lasting among the pagans, he suggests that believers in the United States move together to small rural towns and counties with low populations in order to construct a, quote, small civilization built explicitly on the confession of Christ, which he calls, quote, local Christendom. He presents it in covenantal terms as an escape from the cursed ground of our degenerate cities and the establishment of land that will be under the blessing of the Lord through its direct commitment to his law. Being somewhere with a low population, it is far more practically feasible to quickly become a good portion of the population, and thus more quickly affect top-down changes that make the area a feasible location to plant a church, families, and businesses for multiple generations. In addition to the benefits of covenantal blessings for bottom-to-top faithfulness in a small society that Simmons notes, there is also the important ability to establish our own elites who can control our little society in such a manner that discourages or altogether bans entities that are hostile to generational sustainability. An important aspect of generational sustainability is, as mentioned above, the household as the locale of economic activity. Having a unified place with one's family in a local economy is simply irreplaceable in the establishment of a connection between individuals and their place in the natural order. In our present post-industrial, globalized, corporate, and nomadic society, we have all become nowhere men, ready to uproot at any moment should our corporate overlords desire it. We have absolutely no connection to place any longer, which is a crucial aspect of natural affection for family and community. An observation from Tolkien, recalled by Lewis in a letter to Arthur Greaves, demonstrates the old way that has been lost. Quote, Tolkien once remarked to me that the feeling about home must have been quite different in the days when a family had fed on the produce of the same few miles of country for six generations, and that perhaps this is why they saw nymphs in the fountains and dryads in the wood. They were not mistaken, for there was in a sense a real, not metaphorical, connection between them and the countryside. What had been earth and air and later corn, and later still bread, really was in them. We, of course, who live on a standardized international diet, are really artificial beings and have no connection, save in sentiment, with any place on earth. We are synthetic men, uprooted." If we are to restore natural power to fathers, then we need to find our way back from being, quote, synthetic men, to once again seeing nymphs in the fountains. With power for zoning and, in a home rule municipality, setting laws and taxes, a town government could intentionally aim at contributing to this restoration through top-down efforts. The construction of Walmarts, Amazon warehouses, or Burger Kings could be struck down, with the city planner only approving businesses owned by local families. Licenses for the sale of certain products could be required to ensure that certain families have a monopoly in the area, keeping outsiders from coming in and taking over their economic place in the town. Taxes on the sale of certain imported goods could likewise be imposed in order to incentivize shopping locally, and the more this spreads to other towns in the county, the farther people will have to travel to get their globally imported goods at a cheaper price. Efforts like these on a town level, and then eventually on a county level, could quite possibly go a long way in establishing patriarchal power in communities across the United States. But it still remains true that, as Oren McIntyre often says, quote, the side that wants to win will always beat the side that just wants to be left alone. So it is necessary that, in addition to carving out our own places to rule ourselves, we also go on the attack. This will mean that we can't have everyone retreating to build rural paradises. We need people also building sub-communities and institutions, and witnessing to elites within the degenerate-dominated urban and suburban environments. In these more populated areas, any immediate change in success in community building and organization will occur on household and church levels, or any private institutions over which we already have control. But over the long term, change can gradually be made by making disciples of the city or county's already existing elites. As mentioned in my previous essay, this is a large aspect of St. Paul's approach to cultural change. Throughout Acts and in his letters, he is constantly appealing to and converting elites, who often also assist him on his missionary journeys and provide protection for the church. By making disciples of elites, we not only gain a foothold in higher domains of influence, but we also might gain social or even legal protection for ourselves, 
and potentially for our brothers attempting to build those rural Christian communities mentioned above. The discipling of leads can happen in a couple of ways. First, we can go to them as others. As citizens, for example, we can go to the city council meetings to express our concerns from an explicitly Christian perspective. We can then continue to correspond with any city council members who seem receptive to what we have to say. Second, we can go to them as infiltrators. In whatever occupation we have been called or with whatever skills we have, we can pursue excellence to gain a standing in certain institutions. And from within those institutions, we can potentially find the ear of elites. As Proverbs says, Do you see a man skillful in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before obscure men. Proverbs 22:29. This is basically the approach of Joseph and Daniel. Meanwhile, though less independent than the rural communities, like-minded people can still establish an alternative community and economy within a more developed environment. Rather than having the benefits of civil control, they will have to be more reliant on fathers and pastors for leadership and organization, as well as the voluntary participation of the whole community. Maybe a church could just move many of its members into the neighborhood around its church building, and simply set the Christianization of that neighborhood as the first goal of conquest. Then, despite not having the ability to get rid of corporations in the area, at least begin having members provide alternate sources of goods and services for the community, and refuse to get those goods and services anywhere else, if able, even if it is slightly less convenient or more expensive to do so. While this sort of thing is far more likely to run into trouble from opposing parties in a more populated city, it is on the other hand more desirable in terms of external influence and quick growth because of more frequent interaction with outsiders. In the retreat model, you have the benefit of a more streamlined process in finding nymphs in the fountains, but multiplication will mostly consist of the community's offspring or imports from other areas. We ultimately need people in both areas mutually supporting one another. But beyond these smaller scale short-term strategies of patriarchal renewal that appear far more attainable, we still ought to set a long-term goal that our many minor efforts are aimed at. In our efforts of rearranging our lower level domains around fatherhood, the long-term goal should be to have a renewed patriarchalism make its way to the top of society. This may come as the result of our nation's lack of natural elites leading to the decay and dissolution of the present system, and thus our alternate patriarchal communities rising from the ashes to take the reins. Or, by an act of God, it could be that we are surprisingly successful. The United States first gets a taste of an American Caesar, and then we wind up voluntarily abandoning our present system for hereditary monarchy. The former is far more likely than the latter, but Lord, if you're listening, we are always open to miracles. Whatever way it comes about, we should make it our long-term aim to disciple our nation into the natural design for government, which is for the people to be submitted to one patriarch, who himself submits to the one God and Father in heaven. Obviously, monarchy will not by itself save society. I would much rather, for instance, have a Christian democracy than a secular monarchy. Having a royal father in heaven is far more essential than having a royal father on earth. But to imitate God's rule in heaven, the pattern established throughout the Old Testament, and those before us whose societies did not devolve so quickly into homosexual hegemony, is to establish a hereditary monarchy. That is the natural political conclusion of biblical patriarchy.